Hello, and welcome to episode 216 of Dark and Stormy Book Club. Today we visit with the author, Karen Odin. Enjoy! I'm Ann Dart. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club, a podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome! If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkandstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. Down a Dark River is the first in the Inspector Corvin mystery series by Karen Oden. It came out November 9th of 2021 by Crooked Lane Books. One April morning in London, 1878, a small boat bearing a young woman's corpse floats down the murky water of the Thames. When the victim is identified as Rose Albert, daughter of a prominent judge, the Scotland Yard director gives the case to Michael Corvan, one of the only senior inspectors remaining after a corruption scandal the previous autumn left the division in ruins. Reluctantly, Corvin abandons his ongoing case, a search for the missing wife of a shipping magnate, handing it over to his young colleague, Mr. Stiles. An Irish former bare knuckles boxer and dock worker from London's seedy East End, Corvin has good street sense and an inspector's knack for digging up clues, but he's confounded when, a week later, a second woman is found dead in a rowboat, and then a third. The dead women seem to have no connection whatsoever. Meanwhile, Mr. Stiles makes an alarming discovery. The shipping magnate's missing wife, Mrs. Beckford, may not have fled her house because she was insane, as her husband claimed. Mr. Beckford may not be the successful man of business that he appears to be. Slowly, it becomes clear that the river murders and the case of Mrs. Beckford may be linked through some terrible act of injustice in the past, for which someone has vowed a brutal vengeance. Now, with the newspapers once again trumpeting the yard's failure, Corvin must dredge up the truth before London devolves into a state of panic and before the killer claims another innocent victim. We are pleased to welcome Karen Oden to the program. She has a great new book called Down a Dark River. Welcome, Karen. Thanks so much for having me. This book, I really enjoyed it. It was one of those that's very difficult to put down. Your main character, Michael, a little flawed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, yeah, he is. He has abandonment issues and a few other things. <laughs> <But> <laughs> yes. I liked your female characters. Doyle, she wasn't in there that much, but she's a strong woman. But Belinda is a great character. <laughs> So, oh, I totally agree. How did you research this era? Well, I did my PhD 20 years ago now at NYU in Victorian literature. So I wrote my dissertation on Victorian railway disasters, and that necessitated me sort of researching medical, legal texts, novels, cartoons, poems, all different kinds of things. And so It's sort of my happy zone. It's where I sit. It's interesting that you bring up the women characters. I love Belinda and I love Ma Doyle. And you're right. She doesn't appear all that often, 
but she is a profound presence for Corbin. Like she occupies a lot of psychic space in his head and he has to eventually work his way toward empathy and understanding. And these are things that Ma Doyle modeled for him for years that he only recognizes unconsciously. So I really enjoyed creating Ma Doyle. I also enjoyed creating Belinda Gale. She is an unusual woman. She's sort of an outlier. She's a woman novelist and that wasn't so unusual. I mean, there were dozens of them. And many of them actually supported their families with their writing. But she is an outlier in that she doesn't want to get married. She doesn't need a man to take care of her. No, she does not. Her (laughs) father very wisely created a trust fund for her, warned her on his deathbed. Basically, if you're going to get married, vet anybody for at least several years because people can change and they don't always show you their sort of dark sides when you first meet them. Wow. How different. I love that because most fathers were trying to hand their daughters off. Right. Yes, they were. Except that there's a bit, a little bit of backstory there with Belinda's mother who falls into mental illness. And so Belinda's father recognizes that people can change. And you want to spend some time getting to know someone really well. You spend three or four or five years before you jump into something because he had a very painful time with Belinda's mother. I mean, she lived for 12 years with profound depression. I think that that's why he cautions Belinda. Hey, just take your time. Don't rush into anything. And frankly, she's busy and happy writing. She has tons of friends. She has a sister in town. She's great. I like the scene that you wrote where he went to her house and all the carriages are dropping off people and he didn't dare go in. (laughs) No, he doesn't dare go in. I don't want to give you any spoilers away to our listeners, but the scene where he walks home, opens the door and he's been drinking and he is not in a good place. And she sits him down and gives him a, he's talking to. Yes. And she's completely right on the mark. You grew up in Whitechapel. You're a former thief. You're a former bare knuckles boxer. You're quick with your knife. You're decisive. These are all great skills. Always being the rescuer means you never acknowledge that you're vulnerable too. And you need to do that or you are not going to solve this case. First, he poo-poos it. Never mind. (laughs) And then he realizes she's right. I like that part in the end where he sort of realizes I can't yeah. rescue everybody, and mm-hmm. I have to be on the other end once in a while. This is the first in the series, correct? This yes. Is- mm-hmm. And it starts out with the upheaval in Scotland Yard in 1878. Was that a real event? That was a real event. In 1877, four of the senior members of the Scotland Yard force were put on trial for taking bribes from con men. And the evidence was all there. They had all done it. And it was a huge hoopla. The trial was done at the Old Bailey, which is the big, beautiful courthouse in London. And this is sort of like Judge Judy for the Victorians. There were mobs of people. There were these horrifying newspaper headlines saying things like, plain clothes allow men to conceal the crimes in plain sight. There was one newspaper that said we would all be safer if the plain clothesmen were at the bottom of the Thames. I mean, it got ugly. And the thing is, these four policemen were senior inspectors. Between them, they had over 80 years of experience, which, of course, made like somebody pulling out the rug out from under you, right? You feel like, well, what else have they been up to for the past 20 years? So there was a lot of distrust. So that was really true. That really, truly did happen. After the podcast, I can even send you some images from the newspapers with the drawings of the men in the courtyard. It's actually really cool. And then they did actually pull in this new director, Mr. Vincent. He's a real person. I actually have a picture of him, too. He had never solved a case. He had never served a day in uniform. He was the second son of a baronet. He had been public school educated, which in our language would mean he was private school educated. He was wealthy. Tall, slender, very debonair, dapper dresser. He'd been a newspaperman for the Daily Mail. And he went over to France and did a bunch of research and talked to the French police. When he came back with all of this information about the French police, he presented it in a paper to Parliament and said, look, I've got all these great ideas. And they said, well, we were thinking about clothes in Scotland Yard, but if you want to give it a try, you go right ahead. You can be the broom that sweeps this mess clean. 
And so he took over the art. Wow. Well, you portray him very nicely in the book. He's in charge, but he's not a hands-on. He's sort of trying to guide Michael in the right direction, I think. Right. Yeah. Now, this is your fourth book, Mm -hmm. and your other three were standalones. I haven't had a chance to read them, but they are on my to-read list. All of them seem to feature strong women. Yes. What made you decide, well, Michael Corvin is the one I'm going to write about, a series? This is a great question, and I'm glad you asked. The first three books each feature a different young woman protagonist in 1870s London. She is sort of unwillingly dragged into a mystery because someone she loves is injured or dies or is murdered. For each one of the three, I had a particular aspect of Victorian culture that I wanted to talk about. The first one, Lady Elizabeth and her poor laudanum addicted mother are in a railway crash. In the second one, Nell Hallam is a pianist who wants to attend the Royal Academy but doesn't have any money, so she dresses as a man and goes and plays in one of the music halls that happens to have a crime ring in the basement. And then for the third one, Annabelle Rowe, she's a artist at the Slade School of London, which opened in 1871, and she's an older brother who's a convicted art forger who is murdered. Each one of these cases, I had a particular aspect of Victorian culture that I wanted to look at, you know, the railways, the music halls, the art and auction world. But for this fourth book, it was actually inspired by a article that I read about race, law, and injustice here in the contemporary United States. I read it maybe six or seven years ago. I don't even have it anymore, but it stuck with me because inside this article was a short story about a young Black woman in Alabama who had been jaywalking across a quiet street. A car comes flying around the corner and hits her, and it's driven by a white man. He is wealthy, and he is under the influence of alcohol. She's put in the hospital for months with injuries, and when her family goes to sue on her behalf, the judge awards her $2,000 ostensibly because she's jaywalking. This is a horrible story on so many levels. But what struck me was in the aftermath, the girl's father threatened the judge's daughter's life. I I sat with this for a long time, puzzled about this. And I thought, what's really going on here? This is not simple revenge. And I realized that he was trying to get the judge to understand what it is to almost lose a child. He was looking for empathy and understanding. He was looking for this judge to get it because the story produced in the courtroom hadn't done it. So it got me thinking about revenge and injustice and failures of empathy and how all that kind of gets twisted up together. I knew that I wanted to transplant the story to Victorian England. And given that there's going to be judges and lawyers and fathers and all this kind of thing, I knew I had to have a male protagonist. I had to have a policeman. I read two or three really good accounts of... Victorian police and sort of the rise of the policeman and the detective. He just kind of came into being because I was reading some primary materials about these policemen and what they had to do and how they had to act and negotiate their way around London. Having read the book, I can see how you wove that in. Very well done. Thank you. But yeah, that's the backstory. I was reading your bio and I was thinking about what you said at the very beginning about how you became a writer, but I think it goes deeper than that. You mentioned that your books are born out of trauma, and what you just touched upon was that mysteries have a murder and they're solved, but I think you're giving it a whole nother human aspect to it. You're diving deeper, and I really enjoy that. (laughs) Well, I think, you know, it's interesting because mysteries sort of by their very nature have a good guy who's the detective. And then you've got the bad guy who has, you know, killed someone or done something else nefarious. What I find interesting is that a villain is rarely a villain in his own head, right? So he has a logic. He has, for example, a novel, let's say a woman who is embezzling from her boss. I mean, that's bad, except that he's promised her a raise for three years and he won't give it to her unless she sleeps with him. You know, that that puts a twist on it. You can kind of understand perhaps maybe her justification. So I'm interested in that gray area. I'm not interested in sort of just the, the series of events that lead to discovering who did it and why. I'm interested in those people and how complex we are and how 
we want different things. And sometimes we want two things and they don't go together. You know, that's what the mystery genre need. Sometimes they're just like cookie cutters and you get from point A to point B. And this is just what the genre needs. Oh, thank you. That's lovely to hear. I will tell you that I have, okay, I'm going to confess to my, my sheer nerdiness. I have index cards and I have a long hallway. And so oftentimes I lay the index cards out with the plot arc on one color and the character arc on the other. <laughs> <laughs> and they're kind of in parallel, you know, it's so like kind of move them around. So I can kind of wiggle them. And then sometimes my 18 year old beagle like trounces through them and rearranges them. And I have to like move them back. But I think that character arc and plot arc have to go together. I really wanted to watch Corvin change over the course of this book. And he does. Mm -hmm. Sometimes not for the best, but he's getting there. He, yeah, yeah. I like Styles, and I like Harry. Yes. And the yes. doctor. And the doctor. I can see Harry growing mm -hmm. in the series. I think he's going to take a bigger part than mm -hmm. just helping the doctor. So that's mm -hmm. my prediction. Yes, you're right. <laughs> Now, what are you working on now? I've actually just turned in the third round of edits for the sequel to this book called Under a Veiled Moon, similar to the way that I used the trial of the detectives from 1877 as sort of a springboard into the book. This book, this new one, uh, uses a true event that I found when I was researching the river police in Wapping along the Thames. On September 3rd, 1878, there was a terrible shipwreck in the Thames. There was a fleet of, I think, four or five small wooden-hulled steamboats. You could pick it up at London Bridge, if you know where that is in London. Yep. You could hop on uh, Swan Pier, which is right next to the bridge, and then ride the steamship out. And it would, it made stops periodically, kind of like a hop on, hop off again bus. So you could stop off and have a picnic and then the next steamboat would come by and pick you up and take you all the way out to Sheerness at the sea where the river meets the North Sea. And then it would turn around and then come back. So for two shillings, you could ride all day, hop on, hop off. And so when the Princess Alice was coming back on the night of September 3rd, it was rounding Tripcock Point, which is the blind curve, a 900 ton coal ship with a steel hull ran into it, cut it into three pieces. It was sunk within four minutes, 650 people in the water, all but 110 or something drowned. It was the worst maritime disaster they've ever seen on the Thames. It was so tragic. And of course, no one knew who was on the boat. So then you've got people in London, obviously freaking out because my husband or my daughter or my son, they didn't come home tonight. No cell phones, no manifest. No, it's like a hop on, hop off bus. Nobody knows who's on it. So it was a real tragedy. And history tells us that neither boat was completely at fault. The Princess Alice was someplace she wasn't supposed to be. And the coal ship was probably going a little bit too fast down the river because it was going with the ebb tide, um, the Thames is tidal. And at that point, the water's actually rushing toward the sea at four knots per hour. It wasn't anyone's fault, really. But I thought to myself, well, what if it was? Who would want to cause a disaster like this and why? And the, the initial clues in my book start pointing to the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which uh -huh. was a group that was very active. They would begin doing a lot more bombing in London in the 1880s. So I'm a little bit early, but it's the British branch of what we call the Fenians in America. And the Fenians in America were very well funded. They had money they had people who were expert at detonating bombs, partly because of the their familiarity with bombs because of the Civil War and firearms and things like that. They could speak out publicly in America the way the Irish Republican Brotherhood could not in Britain. They raised money and they sent dynamite over to England. And so the initial clues start pointing to the IRB and Corbin, who's Irish, of course, doesn't want to believe it's the IRB. But he's got this Rotherly, who's the commissioner of Rex, is like, says to him, you're just protecting the people behind this because you're Irish and it turns into a thing. <laughs> and you're going to see Colin Doyle a lot more in this new book. He's one of the twins, Colin and Elsie. Very good. Can you give our listeners your website so they can find you and your books? Definitely. It's very simple. It's 
dot Karen Odin, and it's K-A-R-E-N-O-D-D-E-N dot com. Okay, great. Just as a little treat, if our listeners would like to see Karen in action, I just watched a delightful interview with her and Susan Elliott McNeil that was so entertaining. Oh, at Poison Pen, sure. Yeah, yeah. very good. And also, I don't know when this is going to post, but Down a Dark River is on sale right now as an ebook for $1.99 oh. until June 29th. Oh, very. So cool. for those people who like ebooks, I know if some people like, like I like paper myself. It is also an audiobook read by a really talented, wonderful man named Joshua Manning. But the ebook is on sale until the end of the month. Very wonderful. Good. Yeah. Well, Karen, it was such a delight to get to meet the voice behind this wonderful book. And we wish you all the best with all your future books. We hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much. It was lovely to meet you both. Thank you, Karen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Trivia. Last week's question was, Cornell Woolrich wrote the book, it had to be murder. That book was the base for what movie? A. Dial M for murder. B. The Manchurian Candidate. C. Rear Window. Or D. Vertigo. The answer is C. Rear Window. William Irish was the byline in the Dime Detective magazine in February of 1942, and his story, It Had to Be Murder, was the source of the 1954 Alfred Hitchcock movie Rear Window, and itself was based on H.G. Wells' short story Through a Window. The Bride Wore Black and Waltz into Darkness were also based on short stories. Ownership of the copyright in Woolrich's original story, It Had to Be Murder, and Rear Window, was litigated before the U.S. Supreme Court in Stewart v. A. Bend, 495 U.S. 207, in 1990. This week's question is, James M. Kane wrote which book that became an award-winning movie? A. The Postman Rings Twice B. Serenade C. Mildred Pierce or D. Double Indemnity Good luck! Well, that wraps up another episode of Dark and Stormy Book Club. Thank you for listening. We hope you join us next week. And remember, life would be boring without a little mystery. Bye. Bye.